Hello, and welcome to Preprints in Motion. This is the only show bringing you the freshest science directly from the hottest new scientists. So join us as we discuss science, preprints, and academia. So hit that subscribe button and join us every first and third Wednesday for a brand new episode, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. But for now, let's get into the show. Welcome to the first special episode. This week, we discuss one of the major preprint platforms, Research Square, with editor in chief Michelle Avisar Whiting. So today on the show, we have Michelle Avisar Whiting, who is the editor in chief of Research Square, and. I have a lot of like a lot of questions on my little sheet that we use. So I think we'll be sensible and start somewhere that makes sense. Why don't you give us a quick overview of what Research Square is? Sure. I guess it's more of a loaded question than you probably realize. The short answer, uh, the short easy answer is that Research Square is a preprint platform. But the more accurate answer is that the preprint is really only one aspect of what we hope will become kind of an entire manuscript preparation ecosystem for authors. That's the aspiration. Uh, When we started this thing in 2018, we started out calling it a pre-publication platform, which has a lot of alliteration and is really long and got tiresome to say and nobody knew what it meant. And so eventually we kind of dropped it because nobody wants to say pre-publication platform over and over again. We didn't really want people to see us as simply throwing in with a trend and creating a superfluous preprint server that didn't serve any additional purpose above, you know, and beyond what BioArchive and MetArchive were already offering. So it wasn't meant to be just a new preprint server, but really a new category. Um, where the mission was aligned with the enduring mission of the company as a whole, which is to help researchers everywhere in the world reach their publication goals. So wholesome. It is. It's really true, too. And for listeners who aren't familiar with the company, Research Square, the company is an outgrowth of the 17-year-old-ish company called American Journal Experts, which is primarily an English language editing company specializing in academic manuscripts. So this was the spirit that we carried through to how the platform was conceived. We already knew of multiple ways that we can help authors in the early stages of manuscript preparation. And now uh, that research is increasingly being shared earlier than ever. We can also help them with that. So that's how this whole project formed. And you you are kind of touching on my next question there, which is how is Research Square different from the other platforms? Because to look at, very different. But there's a few things you guys do that, you know, BioArchive, for example, doesn't do. Probably the most important way that we're different from BioArchive, if you just want to make that direct comparison, is that in addition to having a direct submission route, the way that anyone would submit to a preprint to BioArchive, our platform is also integrated as a service into the submission process of now nearly 500 journals. And they're all journals in the Springer Nature portfolio, Springer Nature's majority investor in our company. So practically what this means is that authors who are submitting original research to one of those journals are presenting with the option to post their manuscript as a preprint on Research Square while it's under consideration at the journal. Or, or even if it's not under consideration, if it drops out early, it, if they opt into the service, then they have a preprint and it's permanent. Uh, and anywhere from 25 to 35%-ish of authors opt into that depending on the journal. Different journals have different opt-in rates. So does that mean most of your preprints are coming from that route or are people still kind of posting them up first? Most of the preprints on our platform have come from that route. And beyond the journal integration aspect, I should note that we're one of only a few commercial preprint platforms. We have a business model I alluded to in the first answer. So we're trying to leverage the decade and a half of expertise that we've accumulated as a manuscript services company and work that in as a business model, because of course, preprints are free. Uh, There's not a lot of money to be made from preprints alone. So the hope is that authors can not only benefit from getting a free preprint at the point of publication, be offered a suite of tools, third-party integrations, services that help them with everything um, from grammar and and quality checks to journal selection and promotion, even promotional services. So um, this is why I called it a new category a minute ago. It's not the 
the point is not just to say, great, you have a preprint, call it a day. Uh, of course, that's fine if all authors hope to gain from, from it is the preprint, um, but we know that there are other ways that we can offer support. So do you get more diverse people submitting to you guys then? Because I imagine if you're offering these extra services, you're going to get people who maybe, you know, the first language might not be English, for example, because that's a bit more helpful. Loads. Yeah. I mean, our the representation of the preprints on Research Square is probably pretty in line with the representation of people submitting to journals. Think about the entire, you know, cohort of individuals that submit papers to Springer Nature to say the BMC series. We're getting 30% of those overall, right? So it, a lot more representation, for example, from China than I would guess BioArchive has. Well, I, I looked at that very recently. Um, and yeah, so most of BioArchive and MedArchive, their papers are primarily the UK and the US. China's third at the moment, but that's largely COVID-driven, or it looks like it's largely COVID-driven. Um, but then there's, uh, there's some interesting peaks in that. So if you look at places like India, uh, there's a massive spike in terms of submissions, again, COVID-related from India. But yeah, that is very skewed. Bioarchive is very Western skewed, I think, at the moment. Yes, very true. Okay, so still on the sensible question, but you were not always in publishing. You started out as a, as a postdoc, and part of the people we're trying to target with this podcast when we're not doing these episodes, are early career researchers, so primarily postdocs, PhD students, a lot of whom I can probably say with confidence are not overly happy in their current jobs. So why did you leave the bench? What, what was that a positive decision, or were you? Did you decide just academia was not not great? Turned out to be a positive decision. I couldn't have known that at the time. I think Richard Sever recently posted something about this, that he's never spoken to anybody who's regretted their decision to leave academia. Um, that's been my experience as well. I don't know, you know, that's N of two, but I had a great time at the bench and was very lucky to have a wonderful mentor. And I published well in grad school and, and as a postdoc, but I found myself just feeling totally beaten down by the failure rate of science. You work so hard chasing an idea and then the Western just fails again and again and again. And uh, you discover that the antibody was crap. So you order a new one and it still doesn't work. And these experiments take two or three days a piece. And then it just, you know, uh, even if it does replicate, well, that was just one step in a long series of other experiments and each one just leads to another question. There's just, there's never an ending point to it. So I found myself, and it's both a beautiful thing and a really depressing thing about science. You know, it's great that every, every answer begets another question. That's the whole point. But I just found myself like fantasizing about being a builder and like getting the plans to build a house and just building it. And then the family moves in and you get to be done with that project and move on to a completely new one. It's that sense of finality that I was totally missing. Um, I guess that's what publications are meant to provide, but it just doesn't uh, feel the same. The publishing the paper, we never celebrated as much as we should have. It's what punctuates that long trip through fail <laughs> experiments uh, and writing that narrative that you hope ties it all together. And hey, maybe some of it is even true, you hope. <laughs> <laughs> More to come on that, I guess. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's what it was for me. I just, I couldn't get used to the failure rate. I wanted to do something that felt more, I guess, immediately rewarding. It probably has more to do with my personality. I have a ton of respect for people who fight that fight through research careers. They're all crazy. They've got to be crazy. They are. <laughs> so, so what does your day-to-day -day look like now then? You, I presume is it's very, very office-based. I can't imagine you get out to chat to people about the papers all that often. No, I don't, unfortunately. Um, I So my day-to-day, -day, I guess I, I always try to have one writing piece or talk that I'm preparing in progress. I'm kind of part of my remit is to be a thought leader. And so I'm trying to think hard about things and say something original once in a while. So that is, you know, a goal of, of my everyday but a big part of my job is just doing consultations on preprints to make sure that what we're posting is safe for human consumption. Um, so I, you know, part of my role is just to have the final say, uh, to set the policies by which our screen, by the way, our screening is all done in-house. It's another distinction between us and BioArchive that have, you know, this affiliate network that they use. We do it in-house. I train these folks. I'm the one that gives them the direction around how we make these decisions, but sometimes it's hard to make a decision. And so those papers will come to me 
And I have the fun task of deciding whether, you know, to put our reputation on the line by putting this paper out there or, or hold back and be a little more conservative. So that's a lot of what I do. I'm also kind of nominally on the product team at work. And I don't know how many people have in academia and your audience will have a sense of what that is, but um, it's the, you know, the team that drives the product and the product is the platform, you know, that is the product that we are selling in a, in a sense. Um, and so we are constantly working on improving it and picking up feedback from researchers mostly uh, to understand what it is they're trying to get out of our platform and making trying to make those improvements, working with the engineering team to do that. Uh, and then there's, you know, blog content. I've, I've been managing the blog for Research Square. So I commission that, that content sometimes from researchers, sometimes just from our staff and other people in the industry and keeping up with Twitter. Full-time job. It's a full-time job. I mean, you really can lose hours in a day to just trying to keep up with whatever the last, I don't know, train wreck was in science that you want to make sure that you're apprised of. So I, actually, that, that's probably a good jumping off point too. So you do all of your screening in-house. Could you explain what that screening actually is and what it, because I think a lot, a lot of people have this notion that preprint servers allow you to just post anything, which isn't, as far as I'm aware, isn't true for any of the servers. But could you just explain what checks you have in place? There may be servers that take a much more lax approach. Yeah. I don't know that there are any that just post anything, but I know that there are some that really consider themselves more, I won't name any names, uh, consider themselves more repositories than preprint servers. And I hope that the, that the term preprint server can become synonymous with a organization that does take some responsibility for what they're putting. And we, we bellyache a lot about what we put uh, up on the site. And what goes into it is mostly just making sure that what gets posted is not going to pose any potential threat to human health, either to individuals or to groups, result any kind of weird social contagion about an idea that we really don't want people to trace back to us and you know keeping pseudoscience to the, to the extent that we can recognize it off of the platform I think those are the main things making sure that papers are adhering to ethical norms uh, would be another one so we have our own kind of set of criteria and making sure that you know identifiers don't appear on preprints Weird little nuance that not everybody appreciates is that um, having a person's face, a patient's face or name or, or something in uh, a manuscript could actually be okay for the purposes of review or peer review. Uh, but this person did not necessarily consent to uh, having their face all over a public platform. So there's a consideration for that. And uh, we do post case reports, so we have to be extra careful with those studies. Um, this is another distinction between us and BioArchive. There are certain studies that we agree to post that I think that they've mostly stayed away from. Yeah, I think they're, they're certainly for the Med Archive stuff, their screening is Archive, yeah. fairly robust, I think, these days. Because they were, I mean, they started almost just before the pandemic. So I think they were, yeah. I think they, uh, there was a lot of conscious decision going into what, what they would actually put up for there, which I think is probably a good thing. So your initial stance towards preprints and open science, uh, you said was not, not favorable. Uh, so what was your initial stance? I don't think it was particularly unusual. I guess I'll start with the open access movement in general, which was just starting to pick up steam when I was in grad school. I think PLOS One launched in my first or second year. It was just viewed very skeptically by a lot of people um, in my own circles. I don't think we would have considered publishing in, in PLOS One at that time. You know, that, that there was this notion that I think that made it kind of very quickly associated it with predatory practices, this notion of covering one's own costs for publication. Um, and it still is, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised by how much of this notion still persists, maybe not so much in the US or the UK. But I gave a talk in Italy. It wasn't really in Italy. I was zooming in, unfortunately. And one of the questions that I was talking about, open access, and one of the unintended consequences of it was the rash of predatory publishers popping up. And this guy at the end, uh, the agriculture researcher, said that he really views all open access publishers as predatory. And this was like a few months ago. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that was really surprising to me. I thought we had come a long way. Um, and, you know, it's possible that he's a he's an outlier. But I do think that OA is still trailing some weird perceptions about quality that, that are probably unfair at this point. They really probably had to work harder um, to demonstrate super high levels of integrity in their practices in order to win trust and, you know, instate their editorial prowess or whatever. So th there are probably lots of examples of open access journals that are operating at a much higher level of integrity than many subscription journals at this point. So I don't think it's fair, uh, but I was subject to that kind of bias, I guess, uh, coming out of grad school and was sort of disabused of it joining my company because we've always been very, we've always had a very favorable stance toward open access. Our whole, our whole like raison d'etre is to help remove barriers for researchers. And this was a major one. Uh, and I, I saw the light pretty quickly with that. Yeah. I, I am amazed. So I, I spent a lot of time talking to a, a lot of other crew researchers and it's, it always shocks me that they still seem to have issues with things like plus one or preprints and it's i just don't understand it at all i mean my my circle is increasingly pro preprint so maybe i'm just in a bubble. i think i'm the same, the same way um preprints was even after i'd accepted open access when i first heard about preprints before I ever got involved with this project, it totally rocked my world. And how could you just put the paper online without any peer review? And it, it just took a lot more thought about, uh, I don't know, kind of deepening cynicism about the system and really listening to people's position on this and why why this is actually the better route. Uh, but I do understand the, the pushback about it. And I think I have to in order to have the job that I have, right? Like I, I have to understand why people are pushing back so that I can offer good rebuttals to those objections. Um, but I, you know, I, even I reserve a level of skepticism about it. You know, this project has only kind of recently started and maybe in 20 years we'll, we'll find that, you know, this was a mistake or something. You know, I'm not, I'm never so as a scientist, I'm never just so deeply convinced that I'm right about anything and have to be constantly challenging my own um, assumptions about it. But so far, what I'm what I'm finding is that, you know, the burden of proof is now on the people who are saying this is going to destroy everything. This is going to lead to a lot of you know, people dying and, you know, all the kinds of fear mongering that, that's gone on about it. I haven't seen that bear out. Uh, and so, you know, I actually just published a, an article on Scholarly Kitchen yesterday. It's kind of uh, apropos. It's, it's in my question. Oh, good, list. good. I, I read that last night. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's Scholarly Kitchen, so I guess it's to be expected. But you can see some of the, the comments trending in a certain direction. And yeah. uh, so there are holdouts still on this. And they're saying, you know, you have to come with the data to show us that this is safe. Well, I can't do that. Like, you, you have to show me that it's not safe. Like, where's the evidence of that, or that it's much, much less safe than the traditional system? Well, well that's, that's the stick I'm currently beating everyone I come across with. Because there is now a growing body, and I wrote about this last month, there is a growing body of evidence that is showing that, at, at the very least, preprints are comparable to the published literature. And I've yet to see any evidence against that. Scholarly Kitchen's a really good example. Uh, you know, people on there will often say a lot of different claims about preprints. Maybe they're not very good quality they let charlatans through. And yes, there's always going to be those people who do get through, but you find plenty of examples of those in the published literature. But there's nothing, I've yet to see anything that says they're actually bad or harmful. There's no evidence as far as I'm aware for that. But there is evidence that they're good and they help right. a lot of people actually. You know, it's just like everything you're told when you're younger, you eventually find out is not as straightforward as it originally, you know, presented. And, you know, as an undergrad, I definitely fully bought into the story about journal peer review being just an unmitigated good for science, that nothing published could possibly be trusted without it, and that anything that has been reviewed is effectively past some, like, fixed threshold of rigor that meant it, it could be trusted. And in reality, what you learn is that the structures that govern scientific publishing are, are subject to the same strange dynamics of, of uh, politics, abuses of power, cronyism, um, as all other closed systems. And 
you know, even aside from those types of abuses, it's just often it's just not an honest exercise in, in assessing the quality of work. The outcome of that is, is exactly as you'd expect, right? Like many cases to say that peer review greatly improves the rigor or quality of the study or ensures its veracity uh, in some, you know, like in any sense is an overstatement. Um, and in some cases, just a total fiction. Yeah. I would love to look at how much money is spent on the, the experiments to answer the reviewer comments and, and that side of things to see if we're actually, if it is just this huge money waste. Because so the evidence we we did as a group and others have done shows that the key conclusions don't change much. But what we do find is that you might have a more robust conclusion. But is that robust, slightly more robust conclusion worth, you know, 50,000 extra being spent or a postdoc not getting their job because they didn't publish in time? Do you mean that it's a more robust conclusion and that it's more robustly supported by the evidence in the final version or that it's just stated in a more... So more, more generally, it was more robustly supported by the evidence. So you might have an increase in N number or you might have more than one method showing the same thing, which I think anyone should be doing that anyway, really. Yeah. That's just good science. Yeah. So we still need some rigor in the system. And I think, I, I assume this is it I'm asking. This. So should we remove peer review completely? No, no, I don't think so. I think we need to disassemble it somewhat uh, and probably eventually move it away from journals as we think of them right now. I, this is, you know, uh, I know it's a really controversial take, but there's just something problematic about the notion that an editor will be able to pick out exactly the right people to adjudicate on a study. Um, when, when, you put, when you put research out there, the people who find it first because they're looking for it, those are the people that should be reviewing it. Mm -hmm. The problem is that incentivizing that right now is completely impossible. Like, you know that preprints don't get comments, you know, almost ever. They're, they're, it's really poorly utilized. Uh, the idea of post-publication review right now is still very new. And those systems that are in place to review preprints are not being, uh, are not being utilized, like to, to, to the extent that we would hope, right? Because there is such a force on the other, you know, there's so much demand from the journal side of things uh, to, do the, to do that work for the journals. So this is a flip that's going to take probably decades. But when it happens, I think it will be amazing because you'll end up with, you know, the people who are the most well positioned to talk about the study right there on the preprint talking about it. You see, I mean, we've seen a, the pandemic has helped, I guess shift that a little bit we've seen new services come up that doing this kind of post-publication review uh, a lot of people are now targeting certainly postdocs to do reviews whereas before we were kind of a bit of a left out group although message to all postdocs and phd students put your email addresses out there please which is a uh, kicked off on twitter the other day how do we incentivize these kind of things because i can't imagine a situation where any journal is willing to pay peer reviewers which kind of leans it more towards it needs to be something that is considered for funding and, and job applications, because then we've got an incentive to actually do review more, which is totally separate from transparent review, of course. But how do we get people to, to do that? Because at the moment, you just you do it because it's kind of, you feel good initially, and then it just becomes a burden that you've got to keep doing. Right. I don't think it's us that needs to do it. I, I, people talk a lot about these grassroots movements to let's all just decide that we're going to start doing reviews on preprints. And these are like little tiny groups in the West that end up looking like they're completely disconnected from reality. And, mm -hmm. and they are uh, because it's the institutions that drive these behaviors, right? And so until they incentivize it in some way, I have very little hope that these things can change. And it's the same question about just the other bad behaviors that happen around metrics and um, gaming metrics and you know citation metrics. Which I've just also just given a talk about, so it's fresh in my mind. It the change is going to have to come from the institutional level because uh, we can't rely on people's just pro-social tendencies. Even though I feel like we've all just decided to follow this or be part of this collective delusion. We all, at least the scientists, none of us have any illusions about what what very few of us have illusions about what peer review really does uh, accomplish for us and journal peer review. And yet we all just keep playing this game as though it's a lot, you know, as, as though it, it is this sort of beacon of truth or, you know, and I think it's just because the incentives are aligned that way. And I know Talia Coney will push back on that uh, with his, his thesis on it's not the incentives, it's you. Fair enough, but 
that just assumes that we have enough people that will come to the conclusion that they're just going to, to behave better uh, regardless of the incentives. And I, I just don't, I don't know, maybe I have less faith in humanity than that. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I, even for myself, I'm not sure that I would be compelled to, well, screw it, I'm not going to support this system anymore because I know all the problems with it. And so I'm going to behave this way, even though I know that 99% of other people will continue to benefit from, mm, yeah. from the structures that we've set up. Well, I mean, yeah, if you go against it, you, you're the one who loses out ultimately with the way academia works. You can't, you can't go it's against it. It's not fair it. to ask people to do that. And especially, you know, early mm. career researchers. Yeah. I mean, I maintain that the only way it's going to get fixed is when we kick out all those people at the top who are supposed to be leaders, but they're not, and replace them with people who are actually willing to say we need to do changes. And I don't, I don't know if that will ever happen because I think part of the way you get to the top is by being part of the system. And, and then once you get there, the system worked for you. So it works. Why, that's your thinking, right? But yeah, I think I think that's what's needed. And we're very, very slowly seeing change there. Yes. So in the UK, the, uh, the uh, UKRI, who's our big sort of funding body, they've recently started up to invite early career researchers onto uh, various different panels and decision-making platforms. Not anywhere near the top where we need them. But it's a slow start. I, I'm given hope by some of these initiatives like DORA and the work done by the Center of Open Science, defining new metrics that are much harder to game. Um, they mm. do give me hope that more of this is coming. There's a lot of signatories to those kinds of initiatives. And not all of them actually adhere to the tenets of the <laughs> initiatives. But this is also where Twitter as, I don't want to like be too much of a spokesperson for Twitter because I do think it's really toxic. They're not funding us. Good, so. perfect. <laughs> I do think it's a it's a very toxic place in general. And it's beaten me down a little bit too. But it is useful for revealing abuses of power and hmm. instances <laughs> where people are attempting to take advantage of some, some pro-social movement, but in reality continuing to operate in the laziest and most self-serving mm. fashion possible. Yeah. Twitter people either anonymously or or not anonymously call those things out. And it's been, I, I think, really eye-opening. It's pushing things along. I, I agree it's slow, but we've certainly made progress from where we were 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, I think tw Twitter, is, Twitter is a really good platform to constantly push because it is something that kind of levels the playing field a little bit. It, it gives people who wouldn't normally get a voice a voice. And you can... Again, we're probably going to get sued now, but I'm going to bring up Michael Levitt again. So Michael Levitt, just for anyone who's listening who's not familiar with what has been happening mainly on Twitter, Michael Levitt has been woefully wrong about COVID so far, uh, but he's using his platform as Nobel Prize winner to push his views. And recently there was a really, really good preprint. I think it was posted on um, Archive in January. And in that, a PhD student who was the first author looked at how disinformation has been spread through the pandemic. Really important work, quite well done work, interesting preprint, go and read it. But in one line in the middle of this work, she mentions Michael Levitt by name. And as a response, Michael Levitt decided to tweet about that and call her out very publicly, which he shouldn't, shouldn't be doing in the first place, but it's such an abuse of power. And given the context that Michael Levitt has also been trying to have funding removed or have people fired from their positions, it's quite, I think, a dangerous thing. So the question that arises out of that really is, what can we do as early career researchers to try and push for change? Because if we do something scientific, we, you know, someone there is being called out very publicly in a dangerous manner. I should say it, Twitter backlash against Michael Levitt was great. That was very heartwarming to see. Um, but, you know, we, we're in a position where our careers depend on the person above us more than almost anything else. So how do we how do we fight against that? What ca is there anything we can do? I don't think I have a great answer for that. It's a I, I do think just that we have to have the honest conversations uh, in the light of day. You know, this is why I keep saying Twitter, because it just happens to be where those conversations are happening. But they're also happening on Pub Pier and they're, you know, they're, ha they're happening other places where what we have a commitment to truth at the end of the day. And if we keep establishing and reestablishing that, that's what we're interested in. And that we're not, you know, interested in and taking down, I think maybe that's just not the right approach. Like we want to take down all of the, there, like you said, there are good people at the top too, who really are fighting for 
the ideals that we're talking about here. So a, a wholesale takedown of, of power structures, I don't think is necessarily the right approach. Just a, a commitment to, to the, the fundamental aspects that we care about, that we should all care about as scientists, yeah. right? And if anyone speaks out against those, then they look really bad. But you know, when you start attacking individuals, it gets really hairy really quickly. Mm -hmm. So we get back to the fundamentals and say what we're interested in is the truth and take take things apart and very systematic i've seen this being done all over twitter really amazing intellectual debates about specific points in science i mean we have to get down to the core issues that we're talking about right like the debate is about some specific or you know conversation about molecular biology then you have that conversation not the kind of overarching conversation about well, you shouldn't be in power because because you have a nobel prize or uh you know you shouldn't that shouldn't uh afford you the right to impose your belief system, uh, which, is what, which is what it comes down to, is a belief system yeah. and not one, well, not something that's based in, in evidence. We just keep asserting our commitment to evidence-based argumentation, then we can probably make more headway that approach. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the reasons I started up the, the COVID work I was involved with earlier, with looking at preprints, because I kept seeing these people say preprints were bad and I couldn't find any evidence for it. So I thought, why don't, why don't we go out and look at it? And I, to be honest, I didn't really know what to expect. So at least I went in with it somewhat objectively. I appreciate your work on that. It definitely helps. <laughs> Uh, helps make my arguments when I need to. This is an excellent team effort. I had very little to do with it. So whilst we're talking about pandemic stuff, uh, how has COVID impacted research? Claire? You've, I assume you've seen a huge influx of preprints and articles. Yeah, it's been really interesting. I took this role uh, in June of 2020. How brave. It was pretty stupid. <laughs> and it's like at the primary editorial stakeholder and also the voice of the platform at a time when we were three months into a pandemic. Um, but to be honest, I was already leaning into that role earlier than when, earlier in the year when things started getting wild. Um, and we were suddenly seeing this influx of papers about the, about the virus. Uh, and like everyone else, we just had to stumble our way around in the dark trying to figure out what the right thing to do uh, at, at every given point was. Like preprints were already new and now there's this new virus. So there was already like an ongoing debate about are preprints even safe for public consumption? How are we deranging the information landscape um, by putting papers out that haven't been subject to any real scrutiny? And so the COVID pandemic just really resulted in a lot of rethinking, I think, with like the other servers about the prominence of our disclaimer and you know, our entire approach to screening, actually, how we communicate those policies and decisions externally. And the challenge of preprint screening uh, has always been about kind of balancing that commitment that we're making to post research without real, without really adjudicating on the method, methodological rigor or its potential, certainly not on its potential importance to the field. Um, but we have to balance that with the imperative to stay vigilant with respect to, um, you know, misinterpretation, potential misinterpretation or misuse that could result in negative consequences for people. So, uh, so suddenly we were tasked with being the first line of dissemination from brand new findings on this virus that had the entire world at its mercy. Uh, and we're doing the math on, you know, is this information more likely to help or harm right now? And how urgent is it actually? So uh, that's kind of how it, uh, how it felt, um, you know, being in that position at that time. And it was kind of trial by fire. We learned a lot. This was pretty much like the worst set of circumstances to figure out how to do this new concept publishing. Um, so yeah. it's, it was good in a sense, because it's going to inform a lot of how we do things from here on out, right? Like we'll be, we'll be ready the next time. The next time a virus either zoonotically escapes or is leaked from a lab. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll have better governments in place that time. Yeah, that would help. They might not spread so much. Definitely. So, did, so I know BioArchive, MedArchive managed to maintain their sort of two day turnaround. Mm -hmm for preprints after so did, how did you cope with that were you did you have to hire more staff or were you able to just kind of 
take on that extra workload? Uh, we had to, we had to scale up our staff mostly to handle not so much the screening bit because that that's pretty quick, but the, the actual production work on a preprint isn't trivial. You know, we're you know sectioning it and making it look like kind of like an article and uh, figure handling, file handling. It's all it's a lot of work that goes into it. So we definitely had to scale up, um, and our our turnaround time certainly slowed down during that time. We did try to prioritize direct submissions to the platform. Part of the reason being that, you know, preprints that come in from the Springer Nature submission, you know, cohort are often held up by other things like journal processes, right? So it'll take, it'll sometimes take weeks before it even gets to us for, for posting a preprint. But the direct submissions are the ones that are more comparable to what a bioarchive is doing. And that, that's when it becomes really noticeable if we're being slow. And I know it was, it just was so imperative at that time to get the research out quickly. So we tried to maintain similar to, to bioarchive two, two to three days turnaround on direct submissions. Which is quick, very quick. It is, yeah, <laughs> especially relative to the, the people had become accustomed to. So we've, one of the things we've seen with the pandemic is the, if you look for previous years, the percentage of the literature that, are, that is pre-printed is sort of three and a bit, I think it's just under 4% of the literature is, is pre-printed for biomedicine. Whereas last year it was, I think, 8.4 or 8.5% of the literature. So we've seen a doubling. Do you think that is here to, to stay? Are we going to, do you think people are going to continue using preprints now that have come, that are perhaps new? Yeah, I think the support from publishers should certainly be an indication that preprints are kind of going to become a standard part of the publication workflow. And that's what I expect is going to happen over time. You know, it also indicates a willingness through maybe capitulation by publishers to let go of the, at least their role as originators and providers of content. I think, you know, certainly Springer Nature, I think, has been very progressive in this sense. Um, they were, at least the Nature Publishing Group was requiring that people deposit a preprint when they were uh, publishing on COVID during the pandemic. I thought that was a, a few other publishers followed suit then, right? Just really recognizing the importance of just getting this information out there and, and understanding that the assessment piece can wait. So, I, you know, I think they'll, there will be a shift from that traditional role as the content provider to maybe a doubling down on their investment of their role as a gatekeepers is a negative has a negative valence to it. So I want that Cura curator curators curator. and the certified you know the certifiers of the content. You know I think that's that's what uh, journals hope to provide and and you know hopefully they can get start getting creative and start thinking clearly about where the money should go. Should it be toward high production value and, and consistently formatted references or uh, <laughs> standardized checks, you know, that really speak to the rigor and transparency of the paper um, and, and maybe toward compensation for, for high quality peer review. Like these are all areas that I think, you know, the more progressive publishers certainly have on their radar. So can we start to think about a journal article as really the certified final version of the preprint? Yeah, in my ideal world, yes, mm. yes it would look more like the overlay model of a journal. So I think the preprint shift will will allow for some refocusing on uh, on the part of publishers and put some new creative solutions on the table, hopefully. Oh yeah, hopefully. One, but one of the things you okay, we, we're in similar circles on Twitter, so you've probably seen this. But one of the recent things to come up was uh, transferring reviews from journal to journal or publishing reviews after you've had them transferred. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? What is transparent peer review something we should always aim for? Should it yeah, I think that should be the North Star. I realize there are a lot of complicating issues with it. If, if by transparent peer review, you mean fully transparent and signed peer reviews, and uh, or I don't know if you do, but certainly transparent, I guess that the, I would put the imperative on it being transparent that it is coupled to the paper so that you can see yeah. uh, alongside any, any paper or preprint uh, or journal article, sort of the circumstances under which this piece of writing was either not accepted at a journal or, or accepted, you know, sort of endorsed by a journal. That this is a piece that we're missing with most <laughs> journal articles out there, right? And it's, it's, we're increasingly understanding how, how much of a, a missing piece that actually is for context. So, well, so what, what I did, I didn't, I, I'm a bit on the fence as to whether or not reviews should be signed. I think there's a, there's good arguments against doing that as well as doing that. I think they should be accountable at least to the journals and the editors, but maybe not publicly signed. I think that might be too, certainly for early career researchers, might be a bit dangerous to do. And not now, perhaps. Mm. This is maybe something that we should aspire yeah. 
toward because the the culture of peer review is probably not ready for that and all those power systems that we were talking about you know uh, are not you know the hope is that we'll get to a place where an an ECR can be very very frank and transparent about their criticisms about a paper and and respectful i mean we expect the same level of discourse and respect from from all levels of the hierarchy i guess is the right word mm. that you know hopefully we can get to a place where we can have conversations happening from the top to the bottom the bottom to the top that are focused on the science and and don't uh, allow egos to get in the way too much because we're we you know externally are just holding everyone to this standard i do think that's possible to do uh, but i know it's been a you know it's been a debate uh, around e life um, recently mm -hmm. you know, how, how they're how they're handling those preprint reviews for the papers that that don't uh, ultimately get published, and um, I think you know what they're what they're doing here is uh, super important because it's it's trying we're trying something. We're just saying you know shutting it out uh, right out of the gate because we have assumptions about why it won't work. We have to yeah. try. You know, are a really good journal for sort of pushing and trying things. I'm hoping Michael will come on and chat to us at some point. He's, we're also in the same Twitter circle, so he should. He definitely should. If he listens, then there you go. He's got you now. Because if he doesn't, it's just rude, and everyone knows. <laughs> Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Is that bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Sure, they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. probably go ahead and maybe ask my question that I had it might not be um so I'm not as up to date on preprint stuff as Johnny is but obviously there's a lot of talk about negative data do you, are preprints do you think a way and should be a way and could be a way to kind of get that out the negative data because obviously it doesn't have to be chosen specifically I just wondered what your view on that was yeah I think it's an important it's a really important piece of what preprints are hoping to solve um, because of course there's just been we're on the back of decades of positive you know results publication bias and uh, and that's been terrible I think for science as an institution one of the beauties of everything being digital is that there's no reason to hide what doesn't work uh, especially if it's done at you know at a really high standard of, of rigor and with you know, a really high level of, of reporting, uh, reaches really high level of reporting standards. This can be super useful for, for someone who uh, is in that field and wants to see sort of the full picture of what experiments have been done and which have, which have failed. Yeah, definitely. I agree. So let, let's get on to the, uh, the article you wrote that appeared yesterday in the Scholarly Kitchen. Some of the stuff in there is really, you've got some really good examples of like preprints that you have to either remove or, or are questionable and certainly during the pandemic we've seen a lot of those highlighted a lot by the general public or far-right media or presidents you know I'm not going to name any presidents but they've been involved so could I, I guess it'd be really good just if you could give us maybe an example of one where you've had to step in and, and take action how you did that yeah um and this is 
this speaks to my earlier po earlier point about you know preprints being accessible to anyone, and so the people that are the most interested in in or the closest to the study are going to be the ones that probably look at it first and certainly look at it the most closely. And what that means is that they're also in a good position to find strange things, including instances of misconduct. And I mean, these things would just never have come to light. The, the things I mentioned in, in the article, many of them. You know, the best reviewer, the best editor uh, out there wouldn't be able to spot these things because it wasn't their paper mm. that was ripped off or. <laughs> um, and so it's it's just it was something that surprised me, I guess. I, I wasn't thinking of this as a, as a potential value proposition for for preprints is that it, you know, allows for seeking these things out when they otherwise would get probably all the way to publication um, and, and then you know, if they get published in a subscription journal that isn't read, uh, that it isn't well read, possible that it would just never be caught. Uh, well, even I mean, even if it was caught, one thing I have noticed that preprint servers are really good at is they were very quick at removing things or at least flagging things up. Whereas anyone who follows Elizabeth Bick will know you can report things to journals and it takes years before they do it, if they do anything. If at all, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I am sort of hoping that uh, there'll be more focus on preprints among those, uh, among uh, Dr. Bick and, and others like her who are doing such important work. Um, but but even that they, you know, like won't, won't always be able to, to find those issues because again, you know, it's the people that are, you know, in some cases, I had to think an example in there about figure plagiarizing. This is something that I don't think people consider yeah. even really that you think of plagiarizing, you think of text plagiarism, uh, but it happens in other ways and that being able to just lift someone's graphs and change colors and, you know, change some things subtly uh, would never be, you know, I don't think that there, it will be a long time before we see software that can pick up on anything like that. We do have authenticate to pick up on plagiarism, you know, text plagiarism, something like that is just, you know, we can dream about it. But the person who did that, <laughs> that study is going to look at it and immediately recognize like this is bizarrely close to my work um, and even if you know even if there was no real text plagiarism to speak of this is still a serious breach of conduct so yeah this is you know and and we can like you said this allows us to catch it early before it ever you know gets sort of endorsed by a journal which you can't even we can only put so much expectation on journals to find these kinds of problems because I, I really do think it's it's impossible in many cases uh, pr you know paper mills are another one like that so the fact that we can catch them early and get them marked in some way you know we very very rarely will take a preprint down fully without any sort of trace but most of them will be marked, you know, to, to indicate that there's been some ethical concerns brought up. And I've been thinking about how to deal with this, you know, more recently, because we, we have an example of one preprint on the platform that is under investigation at the journal, which it was ultimately published. And so, you know, it seems like there needs to be a, some indication on the preprint as well, because it's almost almost the exact same paper right and we, we do link to the to the version of record wherever we can so this is this is kind of a new territory for us for like i think we need to uh make sure that we're um recapitulating the story on the the journal the uh, the journal article, if they're saying that, that it's under investigation, that there may be some problem with it, then that ne needs to translate all the way down to the to the preprint mm. as well. We need to notify. So now I have this new concept of an editorial note where you know, I can mark the preprint to indicate that something might be going on uh, upstream of the preprint. So what, I mean, what, what do you do where, because the journals don't always say something is under review, they might do that internally. So I mean, what would you do? Because on a preprint platform, it would be public. So I mean, that, that's not an easy situation to navigate. Uh, no, it's not. Um, I I guess my own personal integrity would lead me to always say something um, if I know. Uh, I, you know how that plays out in practice with all with the politics that you know are a necessary part of business. I you know I can't say, but um, at least in every instance that that I've been aware of, you know, when I can say something, we've certainly posted, for example, preprints that I <laughs> could probably regretted posting ultimately, but didn't necessarily want to take them down or make them difficult to, to access because of that. But I do want people to know that there has been conversations about this by experts, and I want to draw people's attention to it. Mm. And I think this is an opportunity that we have, you know, we have that flexibility on our platform, where we can say, yeah, this is being, you know, there is a pub here uh, thread about this that people should reference. I think BioArchive is thinking in these terms as well, um, their new 
dashboard, pulling in, you know, not taking the, certainly not taking on the role of doing the assessments themselves on any, on, on any level, but to the extent that those conversations are happening either through third parties, you know, through these other platforms, they should all be pointing back to the, pre the preprint. They should be attached to the preprint yeah. in some way. So we have the same, the same goals um, on our platform. And even if that means that it's something going on at the journal article level, you know, whenever we can find it, we have a responsibility to push, you know, to push that through to the preprint. So I take yeah. that very seriously. I think that's, that's one of the things I really like about preprints. As a platform, they do they bring in more than any journal article I've ever read does. You can get your so Pi Archive recently with their rejigged little thing they've got on their website now, which is much better than it used to be. Uh, you can now you, you know you can click on and if there's any public reviews, you can they all put up a little side pane, which a lot of the time where so if you take and eLife have their reviews at the end of an article or at the bottom right on the left, and you've got to click it and then it opens up somewhere else. And having them on the side, I actually use those, whereas I wouldn't if I've got to click on an extra button. I mean, yeah, it just as it bringing everything together is so much better. And there's, you've got more information on the article. You can, yeah, it's great. I think they're all doing a great job. And it speaks to the, the, the scientific article as a, as a living uh, document and really reflects the, reflects science, right? That that's how science works. It's never, I think it was James Heather is on his podcast that said, you know, preprints are the opening of a door mm -hmm. instead of the closing of one, but there was definitely a swear in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly that's exactly it and there's I know there's been debate about I mean there should be an end to it you know eventually you just call it done you don't just keep iterating on that but I don't know there's there is a question about that like definitely there are instances where where scientists realize down the line that you know there's something needs to be corrected here and it, uh, we talked about it in our in x paper and the idea that there really isn't a way uh you know except through some really laborious like er errata or corrections through the journal to keep that conversation going because those things are associated with yeah. have a negative association with them as your retractions right where you know there's a disincentive to correct the record on things and should it be that way or should we be embracing that you know this is just a part of science it's so you know failure rate yeah. that's why i hated it but um, but we should allow space for that. How exactly to do that, I don't know. And I, I you know, I realize that that's a complicated question. Yeah, but it, it is, it's just so nice to have it all there. And quite often, you know, in, if you've got the response to the reviews as well, there might be data in there that you, you would never otherwise see because it's just a little, little graph for someone's question. But that could be the thing you need to then launch your next grand off or solve the problem you've been having for years. And that, that, that might be a nice little way of being able to get in some of that, that negative data that we, we normally produce. And, I mean, my my last paper, quite a lot of the review responses had negative data in it. That would never have gotten out, but not only left, it is out. Um, but yeah, I, no, I think it's a really good thing. That's, I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about when they think of preprint. They just think of it speeding things up, which is the wrong way to think about it. Yeah, I agree. Okay, that I think brings us quite nicely full circle. Uh, well, thank you. That was great. I like these chats. Great. I'm really, really pleased to have uh, been invited to speak to you and hope to do it again. We'll be working our way back around. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week.